Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Susan Kaufman at Attitude Magazine. We are very, very pleased today to have Sandra Reif, MA. She is, um, I would say, the premier educational consultant, speaker, and author on books for parents and teachers on working with students with ADHD and learning disabilities. We um, rely on her at Attitude Magazine extensively for our educational tips, including those that are coming up in our annual Success at School fall issue. Sandra's going to talk today about how to keep your child's academic skills up this summer, make sure they don't fall behind, and how to make that fun. We know that for lots of parents, motivation and having a relaxing and fun summer is an important priority. Thanks again, Sandy, for being here. We're really grateful to you for giving us this time. Oh, thank you so much, Susan. I'm delighted to be here and have this opportunity to share ideas with you and answer any of the questions today. I appreciate every, everybody who's joined us today, and the title of our webinar being Fun Ways to Boost Your ADHD Child's Academic Skills This Summer. That's exactly what I'm hoping to um, that you'll come away with some ideas some resources for doing so. My belief about the summer is that this is a very much needed time for a change of pace from the school year for all kids, but particularly for kids with ADHD or kids with ADHD and learning disabilities because summer is the time that they need to recharge and we need to recharge as, as parents and to have fun with your kids and enjoy your family time and it's also a really perfect opportunity for your kids to explore and discover their new interests or creative outlets or learn new things that interest them. That's the whole key is what interests them. And then have learning experiences that they're going to find exciting and motivating. So although kids need a break from school, it does not mean that they need a break from learning or educational activities or anything to challenge themselves mentally. Because according to the research, there's a lot of research, but more recent ones from John Hopkins University, from their Center for, for Summer Learning, that all kids experience summer learning losses when they don't engage in educational activities during the summer. And in fact, with math, it's, more, it's on average like two months. And on math, it's like two, two and a half months. They call this phenomena the summer slide. So for our kids with ADHD, particularly those who have coexisting learning disabilities, who struggle to you know, learn and acquire the skills that they have, um, it's even more important that they, um, we help them not to lose what they've worked so hard to achieve. So what I'm hoping to accomplish in this webinar is talk about what we can do to prevent them from losing ground academically over the summer to build their skills or strengthen some skills. But in the whole thing, the whole key, the whole umbrella is how to have fun doing so in the process. Because this is summer, this is vacation, we don't want it to be a grind for your kids or feel like they're in school boot camp or anything like that. It has to be fun and motivating. And there are lots and lots of ways to do that, to have your kids engaged in reading, writing, math activities or any educational activities that they find stimulating that won't feel like schoolwork. So I'm going to share with you, there's a lot of games from traditional board games and card games and dice games and tons of educational interactive games online that are perfect for letting them practice and reinforce some of those you know, basic skills that they have. And lots of fun projects that you could have your kids do that um, involve academics and involve building their executive skills and enable them to do some problem solving and maybe infuse some math or reading or writing, but all in fun ways where they don't feel like this is sit down and do your work time, kid. So in every of your, all of your everyday activities that you may not be even thinking about ways that you can, um, like I say, sort of infuse or weave in some, some learning time. could be like when you're driving in the car somewhere or when you're going grocery shopping, or when you have to wait in line to go to a movie or to an amusement park, or when you're watching a sports event, or any of these kind of things. There's all kinds of ways. These are all kinds of opportunities to infuse some, uh, like some mental math challenges, some word games. Um, it also is going to maybe help your kids you know, while they're waiting in line or having to sit still to be able to play certain games with you. So I want to just... Uh, remind you of some things that you may not have thought about that you can uh, 
keep their skills sharp by doing so. The most important thing is we have to build upon our kids' interests. Anything that's going to captivate their imagination and use that to motivate them for anything we want them to do that has any kind of academic um, component at all, whether it's reading or, or writing or research. The list that I gave you, if you go to after the webinar, I don't know if you can open up two screens on your computer at the same time, but there is on, on my website, sandrareif.com, the link at the, the, at the top when you go to tips, Sandra's tips page, that will take you to um, a lot of tips and, and uh, tools that I have for teachers and parents on my website. And the top one you'll see there is called Great Educational Resources for Kids. And that list has many, many um, activities and educational games and, and lots of things that you can explore. But one of the things I want to say about the summer is this is a time that you want your kids to be able to be active and outside and playing and have some green time and less screen time. But our kids do love the screen, the screen time, their iPads and the computer games, electronic games. So at least if they're doing some of those, um, when, they're on, when they're on the screen, they're on, um, doing something electronic, there's lots of ways it's easy to make some educational activities part of their screen time. Maybe we'll have a chance, too. I would like to be able to talk about things that you might want to do over the summer to help your kids get organized or prepared for next school year so um, they're off to a better start. So that's um, I'm ready to go with any questions you may have. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I, I just realized that I for, forgot to mention Sandra's um, books and her website. So before we start the questions, let me just point, just point to the names of her books, How to Reach and Teach Children with ADD, ADHD, and um, most recently, the ADD, ADHD Checklist in its second edition, and her website, Sandra Reif, R-I-E-F dot com, filled with great stuff. Okay, so, Sandra, how, how about starting with reading? We have a number okay. of uh, questions from, from parents who are concerned about helping their child boost reading comprehension continue reading, and, and, and also in a context in which a number of them say that their children don't like reading or are reluctant readers, um, how would, how, what's your recommendation on tackling reading over the summer? Okay. Um, very good question and very big problem for kids. Um, the most important thing with reading, and I, I do believe that it's very, very important for kids to be reading every day, uh, is to find things that are absolutely tapping into their interests so that they're motivated to read. And for, to realize that you don't, that reading, being able to read and to motivate them to read doesn't necessarily have to be a book. Anything like, it could be comics, it could be reading song lyrics, it could be reading directions to how to play a new game, or um, there's, there are great magazines like Sports Illustrated for Kids or National Geographic for Kids or lots of different ways to find, um, to find, to tap into reading, like, you know, enable kids to read. But getting them, but the, the reading material, we have to find what interests them and what's at their level. So if they're doing independent reading, if you want your kids to go and do some independent reading, it's important to find books that they can read independently. So there's a rule, there's like, um, like a, a rule of thumb if you're looking for independent reading books. The, it would be five, that they don't make any more than five errors per page. If they struggle with five words that they don't know how to decode, they can't read that word or they're not too sure what it means, that's probably too difficult for them as far as independent reading. But getting them to read books of interest, of very, you know, whatever is interesting, it doesn't matter what the level often very much higher reading level than what they can read independently, reading with your child, reading um, books on audio books are just fabulous for getting kids to practice reading comprehension, listen, ask all those questions with, to your child as they're reading or as they're listening to um, a book on tape or as you're watching even um, uh, anything you're engaged with with reading, that you're stopping you're asking them questions. What do you think is going to happen next? Why do you think that character did that? Um, how did that, why do you think, of his, what was the reason why he behaved that certain way? 
you know, asking those, those, kind of, those kind of comprehension questions. Anything where you're reading aloud to your, chil your child or that they are reading together with you or with somebody else. If you can't do it, if there's somebody else, uh, you might want to even have like a, another middle school, another, a friend read together with a friend or a high school kid or somebody else who's going to come over and do some reading time together with your child where they're reading something of interest aloud together. But um, can you kind of rephrase the question, Susan? I kind of got off, off track here. No, no, I think that's helpful. The question is just... How does a parent of a, a reluctant reader, and I think you were addressing this, you were answering this question, you've already answered it, but how does the parent of a reluctant reader encourage them to continue building reading comprehension skills over the summer? So I think, I think you're, you've addressed that by saying, you know, read everything from books to, to signs to whatever, as well as focusing on that which is of interest to your child, right? Right. So um, I guess one question, I, 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 if you don't mind my following up, are you recommending daily reading as a formal matter, or is this something that you think parents should just keep in mind as they go through the day um, during the summer? In both respects. There's ways to get, you just have them be reading all kinds of things just throughout the day, but you might want to set a challenge to your child, like let's, let's read at least 15 minutes and, and track the number of pages that they're reading. But yes, some kind of reading every single day. There are incentive programs that are offered, like um, programs like Barnes & Noble has one, Scholastic has one, Pizza Hut, another place called Sylvan, S-Y-L-V-A-N. They have different um, incentive programs, too, where the kids read a certain number of books, and they can go online, and they track their progress, and they take adventures, and they win awards for doing certain accomplishments. And you might want to you know, check and see if something like that might motivate your child to be reading more. Um, a lot of your, just your public libraries have different incentive programs as well. But I do recommend some reading every day, and the key is finding what they're interested in, what would be a good book. So right. when they get okay. to the library or they're – actually, if you go to my – I have – I don't know how many of you are Pinterest folks, but I'm a big <laughs> Pinteraster, um, and I have several boards. When you go to Pinterest.com at Sandra Rice, I have all kinds of boards. I think I have like 50 of them that are geared for parents and teachers of kids with ADHD or learning disabilities. That's what all my boards are geared for, all kinds of activities. So one of my boards is on, uh, I think it's called like uh, books that kids love or great books for kids or something like that. And there are all kinds of reading lists that other people have compiled, like best books that boys love or books about pirates, books about this, the, the Newbery Award winning books. You know, if you find award winning books and books that are um, you know, you can find multiple lists, and from that, you're ch you go with your child, and you see what they're interested in, and if you find some, you know, that should hook them in, regardless of how reluctant they are. If, let's say, they're picking books that are very challenging, then it's, well, then those are books that you're going to read together with them, or read aloud with them, and then have them, you know, you're practicing the comprehension skills as you're doing so, or maybe they could repeat a paragraph that you just read, reread it and practice some fluency or there's different ways to do that, but find their interests. That's the key. The key. Um, Jill Murphy, who was on the webinar, posted a, a suggestion to make a shopping list and cook one meal a week, which involves, with your child, involves reading recipe books, writing math, dieting, budgeting, all of those things are in, in she's suggesting, are inherent in cooking with your child. Oh, Does that make absolutely. sense to you? Absolutely. Th absolutely. Thank you, Jill, for that great idea. But, and just to kind of um, to continue kind of along those lines, like, um, for example, if your kid is whatever their interests are, let's say your child loves to be in the kitchen, wants to be like a chef or something, not only does it involve reading, but planning a meal, doing writing the shopping list, going with you and shopping for groceries and doing some comparative pricing. Obviously, when they're cooking, they're doing some, using some measurement skills. They can create dishes and design something and write a new recipe themselves. You know, it's just taking something of interest in them. Let's say, um, whatever, magic or Mars or they love tornado, you know, extreme weather like tornadoes or earthquakes or anything that they particularly are interested in. 
that's something that they could research, that they could read a little about, that they could tell you about it, that you might get them to, you know, write a sentence or two if, you know, about it. And, but there's lots of different things that they could do along those lines. Okay, that's great. Um, let me turn now to the question of writing. There are three okay. or four parents on the webinar who've said that they're, they have children who love to read. Here's Jesse who says, my son's a great reader, can sit for hours reading a book, but writing is like hitting a concrete wall. How do I help him? What can I request for the new school year to help him write more easily in school? Okay, very, very good question. Well, first of all, with writing and with kids with ADHD, that tends to be the most problematic area. It involves, you know, the integration of lots of different skills and brain processes. So, the, so you have to kind of pinpoint what, you know, why are they reluctant readers in writing? Because many of them struggle with planning and organizing. The, the working memory load, having to remember what I'm writing as I get my thoughts down on paper. What was I, you know, who am I writing for? You know, so it could be the memory. It's the planning and the organizing. Many of them have, are your, if your kids are also dysgraphic and have poor graphomotor skills, they just struggle with the whole handwriting piece and are extremely slow and that whole process is very tedious for them. And if they happen to have a coexisting learning disability where they have language problems and the vocabulary and getting their thoughts together um, and, and being able to express them in terms of language or spelling, there's lots and lots of things, reasons why kids hate to write or are reluctant to write. So again, I think over the summer, we're looking at summer. So any kind of stress-free writing, lots of ways to do that. Just emailing back and forth to a family member, like grandma or grandpa or a friend, or um, writing a menu, writing jokes, writing um, like how-tos. You know, they might want to do a magic trick or something and then have to, you know, ask them to do, you know, can you write down like some of the steps that you did to, to for this magic trick or for... Um, Again, anything that's going to, to like journaling, journaling, scrapbooking, those are wonderful things to do over the summer. These are great suggestions. And, and someone has posted um, a wonderful quote. She says, I have my ADHD daughter posting to a blog um, a each day to help her with her writing skills during the summer. It seems like a, a wonderful idea, sort of taking advantage both of the technology interests as well as, as writing. Um, That's an absolutely beautiful idea. Blogging is it's a, it's a great way to do even an individual blog or the family blog. Mm -hmm. But um, when they write for a purpose, when your kids are, if, if they're writing for doing something creative, like you can get, want to get them to you know, maybe create a story, there's lots of ways to do that that are fun. For example, on the, on the list that I gave you, if you go to readwritethink.org, there's all kinds of... Um, interactive things that kids could do, like creating their own comic. And there's templates there, and they, it's interactive, so they can type things in, and then the picture comes up and all this kind of stuff. There's others, different apps for story writing. So if your kids like to write stories and they want to use technology, something like uh, Book Creator or Scribble Press or Story Kit, those are a few that, that do that type of thing. But for a lot of the writing, because our kids are reluctant writers, and if you ask them to go sit down and, and just write something, they don't want to. If, you, if they're doing like photo journals, anything that they're doing, any of their activities, or you're going on vacation, or you're going on a nature walk, or whatever, they take their photo camp, they take their camera, and they're snapping pictures, and then you're, they're placing their, they're, then they're, you're printing their pictures up, or they're illustrating their own pictures, and captioning, just labels and captions. That's a perfect way to get them to write. Sandy, did you say, um, I just want to repeat this because someone asked, I want to make sure we got this right. Did you say readwritethink.org? Yes. And okay. again, any, anything on, when you go to my website, when you go to that resource list, scroll down to writing. It's prob I think it's probably under writing. If it's not under writing, then that would be under apps. Okay. Yes. I mean, folks, many people are asking about apps. I, I do think that... Um, Sandra's resource list, sandrareife.com slash tips, is, is just filled with great um, suggestions for, for resources. I want to ask a question for, on behalf of Stephanie, 
who's, who's anxious to have an answer to this. It's a little bit of a loop back to the motivation question. Okay. But she's saying, um, my son just flees when I say anything that involves game, puzzle, whatever. He only wants to be outdoors. He just really needs to be outdoors all the time. So this may be a case of, of, of a real need for green time. Any suggestions yes. for learning in that outdoor context, I guess, would be well, what Stephanie would be looking any, for. <laughs> besides doing all of the, at, at any of this, if whatever they're doing, whatever he's doing out, outdoors, whether he's building a fort or he's playing sports or he's climbing a tree or he's swimming or whatever, that could all be still used in um, academically afterwards in terms of telling you about what you did, jack down a couple things that you want to remember to bring tomorrow when we go to the beach. So as far as reading, writing, those kind of things, that could be tied into anything that they're doing outdoors. If they don't like games, I can't imagine a child doesn't like games. If you don't find a game, I mean, there's, it's just searching for games that are of interest to your child. And you can play them, and I would play them outside. So still being outside, but you know, setting up the blanket or the table or whatever, if you're doing board games or, or doing any kind of whatever. It, it could all be done anywhere. So in the context of being outside or active while they're doing it, you could, you could do all kinds of games, different word games, different uh, all kinds of things they could be playing as they're physically active. Um, Jill suggested um, geocaching. What is geocaching oh, for outdoors? Oh, thank you, Jill. <laughs> Jill, by the way, Jill is a friend of mine from Seattle, and if you don't know Jill Murphy, I absolutely love her. She is a brainchild and the most creative person I know with ideas galore. So thank you, Jill. Yeah, I, I, I've never done it, but it, geocaching, as far as I understand it, is it's sort of like a treasure hunt that you do outside, and there's it's a national kind of thing that people or plant different um, objects in certain places in the community or wherever wherever they are and other people find it with like a, like a treasure map kind of thing and they use their GPS system to locate it and then when they find the cache they write something about it so it, wow. I just go online to G-E-O G-E-O C-A C-H I-N-G and just okay. research what is geocaching it, it sounds like a phenomenally fun family challenge activity that it's like an adventure and you could do it anytime yeah, you go on a trip anywhere or anywhere in the community that you're doing something you're going to a park or whatever there are geocaches hidden all over the place that we don't know about if we don't play this game that's really interesting it sounds like you write clues and then a story to to find a hidden well, I don't treasure think, outside yeah i don't yeah i, I it, it's more like in the search the search the challenge of the search and using mm -hmm. using um GPS kind of systems to to locate things because people leave clues. So I, I believe I, again I've never done it. Jill does it a lot, and but if you go online and read about it, I'm sure you'll find information. Okay, Alyssa posted the suggestion to create a reading tent outdoors oh, <laughs> that, that you build with your child, and they have. Their oh, own I love outside. that idea. It's a great I absolutely idea. Absolutely yeah. love that idea. Can I just backtrack a second to reading? Sure. And we, there's so many aspects of reading. If anyone wants to ask later about, you know, things to do, if to build reading fluency or whatever, um, if, I, I'm happy to talk about different aspects of reading. But I just want to point out that if your child, kids with ADHD, the main reading difficulties that they have tend to be because of inattention. They, oh, interesting. You know, it's it's the issues with it's the issue with you know not being able to focus and pay attention. So they lose that you know they they're losing. The details they're missing they're missing details they're missing information that they're going to you know that's going to affect their comprehension they're, if the memory issues so they you know, the kids with our eight kids with ADHD have working memory problems where they forget what they've read by the time they got to the end of the page or certainly by the time they got to the end of the chapter unless you've done some stopping and processing of the information of what they read throughout so that's why it's so good to have them you know as they're reading if you're reading with them stop and have them predict or have them tell you something or or just any kind of questioning throughout the text to kind of summarize anything that you're asking them to summarize what just happened here uh, that those are all really good things for the kids to do to keep them you know focused and to help them with retention of what they've read so also our kids with ADHD the other big issue is they're not self-monitoring their comprehension 
That's like a metacognitive issue, that's, that, which means our, they're being able to think about, thinking about their own thinking, being aware of their own thinking. So our kids with ADHD tend to, if they have reading comprehension problems, it's because they're not, they're failing to realize when they're not understanding something. They might be just reading the words on the page, but not realizing, whoops, I wasn't paying attention to what I read, or oh, that didn't make sense, I need to go back and reread. So those are the kinds of things that are specifically ADHD issues. If you have a child who, in addition to that, has struggled in learning their alphabet and their letter sound association, don't know the sounds for the vowels, struggle with reading little words, are very disfluent as they read, meaning that they, they stumble over every word, and it's very slow and painful to kind of listen to them read because it's such a, a, it's such a difficult task for them. Your child most likely has dyslexia in addition to having ADHD. So I want to point out that with dyslexia, which is a language-based reading disability, it's, the most, it's very, very common in kids with ADHD. Kids with ADHD, there's as many as 50%, as high as 50%. The, the, the range kind of it's variable depending on what research you're looking at. But let's say about half of kids with ADHD also have a learning disability. And many of your kids who are struggling and are so reluctant to read or write because the process is so difficult for them have, you know, very likely have an undiagnosed learning disability besides the ADHD. If this is the case or you suspect this is the case, you need to have your child evaluated. It's very important. If you suspect, um, then you should let your school know that you, have very, you want your child tested for learning disabilities. If you, if, if you even want to look into over the summer any kind of private assessment for dyslexia, if you suspect your child has dyslexia, you might be interested in doing that. So anyway, just it's important to, to realize that so many kids with ADHD have underlying learning problems as well, and they need to be addressed. So their school, you know, yeah, really evaluation and, and yeah. you know, Larry Silver, who, Dr. Larry Silver, who's an expert in learning disabilities and ADD, who's the scientific chair of our scientific advisory committee, is always talking about kids he sees who are diagnosed with ADD, sometimes mistakenly, who in fact have underlying learning disabilities. So yeah, I really think what you're saying is important, um, especially uh, when kids have real problems reading or writing. Um, yes. Can we turn perhaps to math? Sure. I have some folks who say, how can I keep my child's math skills up? And I guess those are the ones that are most at risk over the summer break as I understand it. Yes, yes. According to the research, it's, it's particularly the math calculation and computation, which affects all kids across the board. There's, um, again, math could be problematic for kids with ADHD because of the inattention. They might make, you know, calculation problems and stuff because they, they're not attending to the detail or they have a hard time sustaining their focus to do math problem solving, a planning, organizing to be able to solve a problem. You know, there's all kinds of issues that could be involved with why kids are, you know, might you know, struggle with math. Again, it helps to get to the bottom of what specifically is the issue with my kid. You know, are they having trouble with sequential steps? Are they having trouble with um, remembering their facts? Are, what, what are they having trouble doing specifically? But as far as fun ways to practice over the summer, I think, the, I think math is the easiest to find lots of fun ways to do so. So for example, um, in you know, board games, different board, if they're playing games, there's so many games that are strategy games, problem solving games, they, 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 they teach logic, they teach more than, less than, greater than, equal to, you know, all those kind of skills. So for example, looking at board games like Monopoly, Mastermind, um, Quirkle, different dice games, dice, dice are terrific for practicing, you know, counting or adding and subtracting or, or money, you know, different money games. You're rolling the dice and we're going to add up these two dice and see how much they are. Let's take that number of pennies to convert to what that was. Let's say we have 12 pennies. Let's change that into, you know, how many pennies in a dime or how many pennies in two nickels. You know, lots of things like that that you could just play that are fun with your kids. Um, and, and then on my website, on that list, so many free online interactive math games. 
Like if you look at math play, fun brain, there's one called cool math for kids. There's one called math cats. Lots of games that are just all interactive, fun kind of games that your kids should probably enjoy playing as they're practicing some math, some math skills, you know, whether, whatever it is. So, um, well, Lori, yeah. Lori B., who just posted um, just a wonderful tip. I mean, what I love about the webinars is the people who are participating and, and listening are also offering good insights. She says that there is a website called BoardGameGeek.com that Ooh. lists and reviews all the new great board games that are out there. She says there's just lots of really wonderful new ones. It reviews them and shows pictures of them. Um, so oh, how wonderful. Yeah, BoardGameGeek.com. I know board games were huge in, with my kids and I think made a big difference. Um, there are a couple thank of you so who, much for that tip. Yes, <laughs> Lori, thank you. A um, um, couple of folks who, going back to your suggestion about uh, testing for learning disabilities, want to know some more about that. Um, what, how does one test for learning disability, language-based learning disabilities was one question. And another person says she's, um, her son's eight, and she's always suspected dyslexia, but she sort of has been told that it's too soon to test. So sort of mm -hmm. when can you test for dyslexia, and how do you go about it, I guess is the question. Okay. Well, you can test. The, the earlier, the better that you catch it, and early intervention makes a huge difference with kids who have dyslexia. And you could catch it as early as preschool. Wow. So absolutely, by the time they're... The, the kind of skills that you'll see with kids who are dyslexic, who have, when they're when they're at that young age, is they have trouble with what they call phonological and phonemic skills, phonemic awareness and phonological skills, being able to hear the sounds, being able to differentiate is that a b or is that a d? What sound does the t make? What is the m? What's the, what if they have trouble rhyming or what's the sound you hear at the beginning of this word or all of those kind of associations. Uh, with, with sounds, if you're seeing that your child kind of struggled with that, that's a really strong sign that, they're, that they may possibly have dyslexia. It's interesting that in most of the states in this country, other than I believe like around 15, 16 states, there isn't the word, in special ed law, they, they refer to specific learning disabilities, but dyslexia is not specifically named as a specific learning disability. And there's a big movement to get that changed throughout the country now so that in all the states, dyslexia is recognized as, as a specific learning disability that you have to test specifically for dyslexia, that teachers are well-trained in knowing how to intervene and provide interventions and how to teach to kids who have dyslexia. Several of the states have already passed legislation, in fact, in that regard, and several others are in the process of trying to do so. Um, if you're interested in reading about that, go to a website called literatenation.org, and you could see what's happening in different states and how you can get involved if you want to, because um, there, there is a movement in that regard. That's but anyway, you... Um, on Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. But I would, if you suspect your child has a learning disability, do not accept from the school that we have to wait and see. Okay, that's a great answer. Um, here's a, a Lori, the person who recommended the great website about, um, about board games. Her daughter has been di diagnosed with dyslexia, and she is wondering, in that case, it seems especially difficult to motivate her child to read given her weaker language skills, are, are there any specific recommendations for motivating a dyslexic child to read, or is that a question of, is this where audiobooks come in to play? Audiobooks play are, are, are very, very beneficial, because you're, anything where you're reading together with the child or they're listening to books, and you are, again, interacting with it, interacting with your child and questioning as they're reading and, and helping them try to, you know, figure out words that they don't know, that's all very helpful. I recommend to find ways to motivate your child and kind of build up some of those skills. If your child is dyslexic, then, they, then she would have word recognition difficulty, like knowing her sight words, words like said and the and from, and you know those kind of words that you have to recognize upon sight. She probably has difficulty with sounding out words, what they call decoding words. If you go to my Pinterest board, the one I have one that's on sight word games and activities. 
all kinds of fun things that you could do with that. There's one, another board of all kinds of activities that's under, I think it's called word recognition and decoding and fluency. So there's all kinds of things you could look at. Of, and just find a few things that look, that would be motivating to get your child to practice some skills in, in fun ways. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'll just share with the, those of you in the webinar that I, I, my older daughter was dyslexic, and I was always very concerned, as I think Lori is saying, that, that audiobooks were somehow a crutch and, you know, keeping her from reading. But in fact, at least in our case, it meant that she developed higher-level language despite the fact that she couldn't read well, and then ultimately she caught up. But the audiobooks did not impede, I guess, her reading ability, at least in our case. I don't know whether you find no. that, Sandra. Absolutely. They will never impede reading. They will only advance reading. As you say, it will develop their language skills. It will develop their listening and comprehension, particularly if as you're reading those books, let's say you're in your car on your vacation on a car trip, and you're listening to an audiobook as a family. When you freeze it, and then you can ask your child, what do you think is going to happen next? Or what just happened? Or what was the best part? Or, whoa, can you visualize that scene? What does that guy look like? Or, you know, wh where is he going to? What is it? How do you imagine it in your head? Those are all kinds of wonderful ways to extend and build their comprehension skills. And then, um, not to mention, you know, it really, truly develops their, their vocabulary. And what the, the key to good writing is to be, to listen to lots of good books. Because good oh, writers pick up the language, they pick up the structure, they pick up what they like that other readers, the other authors do well that they enjoy. So the more they read or the more they listen to, even if they can't read it themselves, it's going to very much help them in terms of their writing. Yeah, um, very interesting, yeah. Um, I, to go back one second to the mom that asked about if your child is dyslexic and ways to kind of like in, to work with them, building up kids' reading fluency is kind of a fun thing to do. Um, by having your kids re rehearse and practice. Like, there are things like scripts, like they call it like reader's theater scripts, and they're like little scripts that are meant for kids at different ages where you take a part and they take a part, or you can do that with any book that they're reading. I take this character, you take that, and you're practicing to read, to perform, or anything that they're reading and they're rereading and rereading the same thing. Where each, so if you could find books that are at their level and... Yeah, as they stack up and they get more and more books that they can read on their own, have them practice reading that out loud and rereading, or reading music, you know, printing out lyrics to songs and reading that um, poetry. On the list that I gave you, if you look under fluency, there's a couple websites, one called Giggle Poetry, one called Poetry for Kids, and there are all kinds of cute short little poems and rhymes that if you get your kids to practice reading that and rehearsing that, those would also be they're very, very good ways to build up some skills. That's great. Those are great suggestions. Um, just turning to a different area, um, there's, a, there's a person here who's asked about building up her child's oral, oral fluency. She feels that her, I guess her, her child is, her son is entering middle school, and she's thinking that he's going to be asked to present orally more than he has in the past, which is something that's been difficult for him. Do you um, have suggestions on that? Yes, I would suggest any of the things that are of interest to him. Let's say it's doing a magic trick, or let's say that, you know how to build a go-kart, or whatever it might be. They, maybe they have a collection about something. They, maybe he collects certain things, whatever it might be, or how to do you know, certain strokes in, in swimming or skateboarding. To to bullet down some ideas of what they want to say, and to practice and rehearse and like do a performance for you. Kids will do all kinds of things for an audience. Sometimes you can't get oh. them to write or can't get them to <laughs> present or can't get them to read if they don't have an audience. But if, you, if they're doing something where they're going to have an audience, then it can, tep, you know, it can motivate them to practice doing things. So with a vid, take out the video camera and have your child you know, make a YouTube video of doing something and demonstrating as they as they talk it through, but yes, that's one of there's a it, there's something called the Common Core State Standards that that most of the states, 48 states, have adopted, and they're at the different stages of implementation now in different school districts throughout the, you know throughout the country, and that's one of the standards that is going to be important. Their oral presentation, 
Um, right. Some of the, the key things that are changing that are going to be a little bit more intensive for our kids, are that they have to be involved with a lot of what they call collaborative, cooperative learning, a lot of group work learning, and being able to um, use very you know their, their critical thinking skills of being able to analyze information, discuss information. They have to be able to you know be good discussers and prove their points with evidence. That's going to be very big in the standards this year, too. Evidence. Show me the evidence. What's my logic? What's my reasoning? So anything that you can get your kids to, if they're trying to, for example, persuade you to go buy a pet over the summer or to go to a certain amusement <laughs> park, you know, that's a good opportunity to practice persuasive discussion or persuasive writing. You know, give me all the pros. Give me all the cons. Go do some research. Tell me how much it costs to get from, you know, how much tickets are going to cost or how, what attraction, you know, just... Do the, you know, it's whatever it's going to be, persuade me why this is a good idea. And have me, you know, convince. And then you could do it in writing or they could do it in, uh, you know, verbally. Right. So, so make, make these activities, both speaking and writing, ones that relate to concerns your child has or things that are interesting. That's, yeah, that, that's yes. really fascinating. Very uh, interesting. One of the things, one of the things you're asking, like, about um, uh, with math, you know, math is a really great way to have different math challenges throughout the day, throughout the summer, whatever. Like if you're taking a, planning a family vacation trip, if your kid is old enough and can do this, they can go online and research what's the distance between here and there. What um, our car gets, let's say, 20 miles to a gallon of gas. Gas costs X amount of money. How much is it going to cost us to get to this certain place? Uh, you, you know, you could play... Uh, if they're going to, they want to get tickets to go somewhere, like to a sporting event or miniature golf or whatever it might be, have them check to see how much are tickets, how much it's going to cost. Adult tickets cost this much. Child's tickets cost this much. Calculate, figure out how much, you know, what, what's this going to be. Um, but using mental math while you're even standing in line, let's say, um, mm -hmm. you know, there are all kinds of things that you can do that are going to get your kids to do some problem solving and thinking that they might take it as a challenge and think of it as fun, which it should be. Right, right. Um, a suggestion here from one from John and, and someone earlier also recommended a website called learningworksforkids.com. It says it has an enormous number of wonderful uh, game and app guides for parents of children with learning disabilities, and especially specifically for help with reading, writing, and math. Um, so uh, there's another piece of advice from they, they update the guides frequently and they even offer a service to tailor suggestions specifically for my child. Wow. That sounds yes. Great. I, I thought I had that one on my list. It may be there. That list is so long. I'm trying to scroll down and see if I have it. Can you repeat that just in case I don't? Sure. It's learningworksforkids.com. Sounds mm -hmm. fabulous. Thank you, John. Works um, for kids. Thank you so much. Okay. There's a person asking for a specific example of, of something you can do for motivating kids to do math. Um, I think you've talked a lot about some, I think you have given some specific examples in line, calculating the cost of things. But is there another example of a specific activity that relates to math that you might offer? Deli K would like to know. Well, those math games, and again, I don't know the, how old the child is. Right. So a lot's going to depend on, you know, the age of the child. But um, any, of those, any, of those, if, any of those challenges that are involving what, they're, what they need to do. So let's say they want to go buy a new, I, I, I'm assuming this is a little bit of an older child. If it's an older child mm -hmm. and they want to go buy a new outfit or they could go through the ads, they could go pick out. Um, things that they want, you know, check the prices, do comparative shopping with different, you know, magazines, you know, whatever ads you have in the house that are coming in from the places that they um, like to shop at or if they go online. Uh, let's say they're at a restaurant. Restaurants are a great place to be practicing math. So they could be estimating first, you know, what, how, how much is it going to cost for our meal? They could, you could, if they're old enough, they can, you can help them figure out, you know, how do you figure out that, how much should we leave, you know, the, the server for a tip? What, what, you know, there's all kinds of different things. You know, help make change. You know, can you pull out the money here and let's pay in cash for this meal? And right. can you, you know, pull it out and let's see, let's check the, let's check the, um, the change. 
but or keeping track of scores of their favorite baseball team. You know, if they're let's right. say they're oh, those are great examples. Absolutely, yeah. There are a couple of questions here about sort of the schedule of the summer. One person uh -huh. wants to know: Should we have a specific? Should we decide upon a specific set of skills? that were a plan for the summer or should we just kind of do a variety of activities and someone else wants to know if she should I'm, 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 I'm thinking these are related questions I hope I'm right the other person wants to know if she could should give her son sort of a month off until sort of at the end of July and then restart you know focusing on academics so it's kind of you know a question of on a daily basis, should you be thinking about what you're going to accomplish, or should you just sort of let it happen? I I think um, from I think there needs to be learning time every day, and I think it's probably a good idea for many of you. It, it's going to depend on you, your family, your child. You know you know best, and I don't want to make a global statement of how scheduled you should be or how how you should not. For for many of our kids, they would do best if there is a certain time of the day where we're doing some activities or things that you want them to work on, and the rest of the day they have time off, and then you do just all the infusing of weaving and things like I'm suggesting. But there, some of our kids need to be or, or benefit from or would like to have a certain time where they're doing whatever it is. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're reading or, yes. So what, I guess what I want to say is yes, for some kids a schedule may work well. Some of your kids, you all have different situations. So many of your kids are very heavily scheduled this summer in all kinds of activities and have all kinds of um, learning opportunities throughout the summer where they're through camps and, and classes. And like I said, you may be very heavily scheduled. So right. in, in that case, you may want just simply time for just reading and, and just, uh, you know, just less less structured kind of stuff. So it's going to depend on your child. I don't recommend having uh, the kids perceive like this is a time off from all learning to have any, you know, that every day learning and reading and writing and, and math, it's part of every day and everything that we do. If they see that it's part of everything that we do, then um, you know, it shouldn't be stressful, but it shouldn't be a complete time okay. off either, okay. in my opinion. Some folks have said, I mean, Melinda says she constructed a schedule with her daughter that, you know, included art, music, different playtime, mm -hmm. different activities. I'm seeing like one solution. Um, here's a question about um, multi-step problem, multi-step directions. Rose, mm -hmm. who says her, her, her child understands math, but his difficulty is directly on remembering multi-step directions. So... If the, if the math problem is broken down, he's fine, but he can't remember to put the pieces together. Are there activities or that you recommend for incre increasing the ability to comprehend? And is that an, an auditory memory issue? Is that, I mean, what? Is that's, that a, that's, a, that's a very, that's a, a pretty complex issue that's very, yeah. very common. Multi-step can involve sequencing. It right. involves... Um, it involves memory for the most part, a lot of just being able to hold that information in mind right. unless there is something and then in, in breaking things down, being able to analyze it. And, and so that if there's several, several components to why that's a problem, but that is just a, a very significant problem for most of our kids. So with math, it's more, um, I find in my experience with teaching and everything that it's, it's more giving them s some strategies for, what to do when you're presented with, you know, multiple things, like going through and highlighting in the directions the keywords that finding um, uh, just just basically how to break it down. And off the top of my head, I can't like think of different ways to to do that. But but I have all the information. Um, it's just not coming to me right now. But yes, okay. how, just analyzing the problem, remembering steps. They need to have visual cues. You think our kids with ADHD need to have everything visualized. So if it's a step-by-step -step procedure, things like an index card or a checklist that first I do this, that, and the other, that's important. Um, any of the algorithm, anything like that where it's, it's visual. So, right, right. Um, I, think there, I think you're, there's no question but that most of our kids have serious problems with multi-step directions. And, you, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it, it pervades lots of learning issues for sure. Um, 
it's a, it's a, it's a serious issue. Um, yeah. And anything step-by-step step with checkoff lists and just visual reminders of the procedure in, right in front of them to refer to. Yeah, Linda posted a note saying a graphic organizer for multi-step math. I'm not sure what yes. that means. Okay, yeah. a graphic organizer. organizer. Thank you for bringing that up. A graphic organizer, and there's hundreds of different types. There, like In math, it's let's say you're going to use a very simple one. It's like a web, like a spider web, where you're um, putting the, the, main, the main thing in the middle, and then there are different like um, lines that shoot out from the center concept, and you're, you're jotting down um, on each of those lines what the different steps are. Or uh, j Graphic organizers, for example, are typically used in writing assignments. So when you write, because writing and planning and organizing your ideas is so difficult, that when you first cluster your ideas using some kind of a visual form to write them on, those are called right. graphic organizers. So they're like all different mind, kinds, like mind map. Mind maps, exactly. Mind right. maps, little okay. bubble sheets, those kind of things. Those help in all areas. It help with comprehension. If you're trying to organize your ideas, what did, what, what did I understand from this article I just read? You could cluster them on, you know, or organize them on some kind of a graphic organizer. But also, as, as that response was, it, it, it would help in analyzing um, and remembering steps to okay. a problem as well. Um, Allison is very anxious that, to know your thought of the, on the Fast Forward program. Is it helpful for children who are just beginning to lead, read and write going into grade one? Um, if your child has a language processing problem, I, I've never used the program personally, but, but I know it is a research-validated good program that does help okay. lots of kids. So I would just read more about it if it's recommended. Particularly, um, you know, it, it is a good program that I do know. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there are some questions about transitions. So uh -huh. um, one parent, for example, is asking for your advice on helping a child who's going to enter middle school shortly, I mean, in the fall. So for the first time, multiple teachers, trans lots of transitions during the day. What are some ways to prepare that child over the summer? Well, to prepare the child, kind of anything that you could do to walk them through First of all, the environment. If you're able to go to the, the middle school first and see what it looks like over the summer, you know, the teachers are out. But if you catch them before the school year starts and the teachers are back and you're, and you're able to uh, walk them to different classes and see what their lockers may be if they have lockers or, or any of those kind of practices once the school begins that way is helpful. If, and as far as preparing in terms of you as the parent, you know, getting your child prepared with that, those teachers very early in the school year, that meeting is critical. But um, in, in general, getting your kids prepared for the next school year um, involves like a lot of organizational help. I would use the summer, if you know, use this opportunity over the summer if you can to maybe do some parent-child organizing projects that will, for, to get them on a, a clean slate and thinking more organized and geared up for what the new year is going to bring. So if you haven't done so yet, you might want to, you know, look at going through their drawers or, de you know, together. This is all a together project. Going through their desk drawers, going through their closet, going through notebooks, going through any of their previous school year work. And let, let's, and, and organizing, getting an organization system, you know, getting them back into shape. With their previous school work, I would have your child, if you, if you haven't done something like this, you might want to consider just making, like, uh, just digital pictures even of some of their assignments, some of the things that they've kept that they want, but they don't want all that paper. They don't want to keep all the paper, but you want to just have a record of it digitally. You could just snap pictures of each, each of the different things that they did. But keep up, before you dump anything or put it away for good, to have your child, you know, go through that stuff with you. And... Any changes, now is like a good time if you're looking at maybe our homework area needs to be, re be re, you know, redone. You know, what would you like for a homework area that you think would be cool and motivating and a good place to work? Or is there anything different in your room that you would like to see that would help you be better organized and prepared for next school year? And maybe they, you could do that as a project together where there, you know, it, maybe it does involve, you know, some new shelving or some new furniture or whatever. But this is um, a, a good opportunity over the summer so that when the school year begins and then, of course, they're getting you know, their supplies and what they want um, 
that would all play into it. That makes sense. Um, Jill says, <laughs> how about creating a command center and a staging area now over the summer so that you're ready for, um, um, for the fall? Um, command center. I love that term, yeah, wow. That sounds good. I like that. That sounds good. Can you give do, us more do, details, do, Jill? <laughs> we need you to be online so we can hear you, Jill. <laughs> um, she says, Jill says, Sandy has a lot of Pinterest ideas for this. So go to Sandy's oh. Pinterest page. Oh, I'm glad you online. reminded me. That's right. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, that, that homework board that I have, these yeah. parents that have pinned there have such unbelievably cool ideas of what they did for their homework centers that you just might want to, might want to take a look. Really? Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're coming to a close. This has been super helpful, Sandra. Really, really grateful. And I really want to recommend Sandra's um, tips list on her website as long, and, and on lots of the other uh, wonderful references that have been made by, by people today. So thank you all. Thank you, Sandra, so much. And have a wonderful My summer. Pleasure. Thank you. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.